though his voice still speaks as forcefully as ever in the what do you want uh so we're going to be reading how to win friends and influence people by Dale carnegie and by the end of each chapter we're gonna write a little summary about what we learned how can we apply it to ourselves things that that we struggle with and things that just you know cool, cool stuff that uh that helps us kind of understand the teachings of this book a little better okay uh, let's get into it i'm just gotta move my lap time come on come on, up, come on. There you go. Okay. This book is dedicated to a man who doesn't need to read it. My cherished friend, Omar Coy. Oh, Corey. Contents preface. How this book is written and why. Nice suggestions on how to get the most out of this book. Part 1. Fundamental techniques in handling people. If you want to get honey, a kick over the beehive. Uh, the big secret of dealing with people. He who can do this has a whole world with him. He who cannot walk a lonely way. Part 2. Six ways to make people like you. Do this and you'll be welcome anywhere. Some good impressions. If you don't do this, you're headed for trouble. An easy way to become a good conversationalist. How to interest people. How to make people like you instantly. Part 3. Uh, how to win people to your way of thinking. You can't win an argument. A sure way of making enemies and how to avoid it. If you're wrong, admit it. A drop of honey, the secrets of Socrates, the safety value in handling complaints, how to get cooperation, a formula that will work wonders for you, what everybody wants, an appeal that everybody likes, the movies do it, TV does it, why don't you do it? When nothing else works, try this. And then part four, be a leader who, okay, looks good on my shit. Be a leader, how to change people without giving offensive or ar arousing resentment. If you must find fault, this is the way to begin. How to criticize and not be hated for it. Uh, talk about your own mistakes first. No one likes to take orders. Let the other person say face. How to spur people on to success. Give a dog a good name. Make the fault seem easy to correct. Making people glad to do what you want. A shortcut to dis distinction by Lo Lowell Thomas. About Dark Carnegie Training Index. Okay. Preface. How to Win Friends and Influence People was first published in 1937. In, in, an, in addition of only 5,000 copies, neither Dell Carnegie nor the publisher, Simon and Sh Sh Schouster, anticipated more than this modern, modest sell. To their amazement, the book became an overnight sensation. An, edit an, edit an edition after edition rolled off the presses to keep up with the increasing public demand. How to Win Friends and Influence People took it its place in publishing history as one of the all-time international bestsellers. It touched a nerve and filled a human need that was more than a faddish phenomenon. A post-depression days. As evidenced by its continued and uninterrupted sales into the 80s, almost half a century later, Doug Carnegie used to say that it was easier to make a million dollars than to put a phrase into the English language. How to win friends and influence people became such a phrase, quoted, paraphrased, Parodied, used in innumerable contexts, from political cartoons to novels. The book itself was translated into almost every known written language. Each generation has discovered it anew and has found it relevant. Which brings us to the logical question. Why revise a book that has proven and continues to prove its vigorous and universal appeal? Why temper with success? To answer that, we must realize that Dale Carnegie himself was a tireless reviser of his own work during his lifetime. How to Win Friends and Influence People was written to be used as a textbook for his courses in effective speaking and human relations, and is still used in those courses today. Until his death in 1955, he constantly improved and revised the course itself to make it ap applicable to the evolving needs of an ever-growing public. No one was more sensitive to the changing currents of present day than the day life than Dale Carnegie. He constantly improved and refined his methods of teaching. He updated his book in, on effective speaking several times. 
Had he lived longer, he himself would have revised how to win friends and influence people to better reflect the changes that have taken place in the world since the 30s. Many of the names of prominent people in the book, well known at the time of first publication, are no longer recognized by many of today's readers. Certain examples and phrases seem as quaint and dated in our social climate as those in Victorian novels. The important message and overall imp impact of the book is weakened to the extent or purpose. Therefore, in the re revision is, the, is to clarify and strengthen the book for a modern reader without tampering with the content. We have not changed how to win friends and influence people except to make a few ex 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 excursions and added a, a few more contemporary examples. The brash, breezy Carnegie style is intact. Even the 30 slang is still there. Del Carnegie wrote really spoke uh, essentially the exuberant colloquial conversational manner. But his voice still speaks as forcefully as ever in the book and in, and in his work. Thousands of people all over the world are being trained in Carnegie's courses in increasing numbers each year, and other thousands are reading and studying how to win friends and influence people and being inspired to use its principles to better their lives. To all of them, we offer this revision in the spirit of honoring and pol polishing of a finely made tool. Dorothy Carnegie. Miss Dale Carnegie, 1981. Aww how this book is written and why. During the first 35 years of the 20th century, the publishing houses of America printed more than a fifth of a million different books. Most of them were deadly dull and many were financially financial failures. Many, did I say, the president of one of the largest publishing houses in the world confessed to me that his company, after 75 years of publishing experience, still lost money on seven out of eight, every eight book, books it published. Why then did I have the tim, tim, the timerty? What is this? What is the timerty. Excessive confidence or boldness. Can I hear it? Can you tell me? Oh, whatever. Tim, Tim, Timurti. Excessive confidence or boldness. Audacity. Oh, no one had the, the, the Timurti to question his conclusions. Uh. <laughs> so why did I have the Timurti to write an other book? And after I had written it, why should you bother to read it? Her questions, both, and I'll try to answer them. I have, since 1912, been conducting educational courses for business and professional men and women in New York. At first, I conducted courses in public speaking only, courses designed to train adults, by actual experience to think on their feet and express their ideas with more clarity, more effectiveness, and more poise, both in business, in interviews, and before groups. But gradually, as the seasons pass, I realized that I as sorely as these adults needed training in effective speaking, they still need they, they, they needed still more training in the fine arts of getting along with people in everyday business and social contracts. I also gradually realized that I was sorely in need of such training myself. As I look back across the years, I am appalled at my own frequent lack of finesse and understanding. How I wish a book such as this had been placed in my hands 20 years ago. What a priceless boon it would have been. Dealing with people is probably the biggest problem you face. Especially if you're in a business. Yes, and that is also true if you're a housewife, architect, or engineer. Research done a few years ago under the auspices? Auspice. Noun. A divine or prophetic token. Ah, oh, phrases under the auspice of. With the help, support, or protection of. Oh, okay, I see. With the. Oh, uh. Oh, let's see. Uh, auspice of Carnegie of the Carnegie Foundation for the advancement of teaching uncovered a most important and significant fact, a fact later confirmed by additional studies made at the Carnegie Institution of Technology. These investigations revealed that even in such te technical lines as engineering, about 50% of one's financial success is due to one's technical knowledge, and about 85% is due to skill in human engineering. To personally and to personality personality and the ability to lead people 
For many years, I conducted courses each season at the Engineers Club of Philadelphia and also courses for the New York chapter of the American Institution of Electrical Engineers. I total of probably more than 50 hundred engineers have passed through my classes. They came to be me because they had finally realized after years of observation and experience that the highest paid personal personnel in engineering are frequently not those who know the most about engineering. One can, for example, hire mere technical ability in engineering, a, a, Account accountancy, architecture, or any other profession at nominal salaries, but the person who has technical knowledge plus the ability to express ideas, to assume leadership, and to arouse enthusiasm among people, that person is headed for a higher earning power. In the heyday of his activity, John D. Rockefeller said that the ability to deal with people is as purchasable a commodity as sugar or coffee, and I will pay more for that ability, said John D., than for any other under the sun. Wouldn't you suppose that every college in the land would conduct courses to develop the highest priced ability under the sun? But if there is just one political or one practical common sense course of that kind of given for adults in even one co college in the land, it has escaped my attention up to the present writing. The University of Chicago and the United YMCA schools conducted a survey uh, to deter what adults want to study. That survey cost. 25,000 and took two years. The last part of the survey was made in Madrid, con Connecticut. It had been chosen as a typical American town. Every adult in Madrid was interviewed and requested to answer 156 questions. Questions such as, what is your business or profession, your education, how do you spend your, your spare time, what is your income, your hobbies, your ambitions, your problems, what subjects are you most interested in studying, and so on. The survey revealed that health is the prime interest of adults and that their second interest is people, how to understand and get along with people, how to make people like you and how to win others to your way of thinking. So the committee conducted the survey resolved to conduct such a course for adults in Madrid. They searched diligently for a practical textbook on the subject and found not one. Finally, they approached one of the world's outstanding authorities on adult education and asked him if they knew of any book that met the needs of this group. No, he replied. I know what those adults want, but the book they need has never been written. I knew for experience that this, this statement was true, for I myself had been searching for years to discover a practical working handbook on human relations. Since no such book existed, I have tried to write one for use in my own c c courses. And here it is. I hope you like it. In preparation for this book, I read everything that I could find on the subject, everything from newspapers, columns, magazine articles, records of the family courts, the writings of the old philosophers and the new philosophers, the new psychologists. In addition, I hired a trained researcher to spend one and a half years in various libraries reading everything I had missed, plowing through er er erotic tomes. Uh, I get this. Give me, give me. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Having or showing great knowledge or learning or write. Right. Origin, late Middle English, the past principles of it, right? Instruct, train. Okay, so like I guess like tomes that kind of te like, like give teachings, right? Like a vast knowledge of like this way of being, I guess. Plowing through a uh, uh, right tomes on psych on psychological on, on on psychology, pouring over hundreds of magazine articles, stretching through countless biographies, trying to ascertain how the great leaders of all ages had dealt with people. We read their biographies, we read their life stories of all great leaders from Julius Caesar to Thomas Edison. I recall that we read over 100 biographies of Theodore Roosevelt alone. Whoa. We were determined to spare no time, no expense, to discover every practical idea that anyone had ever used throughout the ages of winning friends and influenced people. I personally interviewed sources of successful people, some of them world, world famous inventors like Macar Macaroni and Edison. Political leaders like Franklin D. Roosevelt and James Farley, business leaders like Owen D. Young, movie stars like Clark Gabe, Gabble, and Ma Mary Pinkford, and explorers like Martin Johnson, and and try to discover the techniques they use in human relations. From all the material I pre prepared, a short talk I called it "How to Win Friends and Influence People." I say short. It was short in the beginning, but it soon expanded to a lecture that consumed one hour and 30 minutes. 
For years, I gave this talk each session to adults in the Carnegie Institute courses in New York. I gave talk, I gave the talk and urged the listeners to go out and test it in their, in their business and social contracts, and then come back to the class and speak about their experiences and the results they have, have had achieved. What an interesting assignment. These men and women hungry for self-improvement were fascinated by the idea of working in a new kind of laboratory, the first of the first and only laboratory of human relationships for adults that had ever existed. The, this book was wasn't written in the usual sense of the word. It grew as a child it grew as a child grows. It grew and developed out of a laboratory, <laughs> out of experiences of thousands of adults. Years ago, we started with a set of rules printed on a card no larger than a postcard. card. The next session we printed a larger card than a leaf, a lefet, than a lefet. What? The next season we printed a larger card than a, lef, a lefet. What's a lefet? A printed sheet of paper, sometimes folded, containing information or advertising and usually distributing free. Oh. Huh. Each like a lefet structures to the compound leaf. Okay, I get that. Well, we printed a larger card than a Lafette. Okay. Then a series of booklets, each one expanding the size and scope. After 15 years of experiment and research came this book. The results have set down here are not mere theories or guesswork. They work like magic and <laughs> incredible as it sounds. It kind of does from what I, from what the teachings that I've got from it so far. I have seen the applications of these principles literally revolutionize the lives of many people. To illustrate, a man with 314 employees joined one of these course courses. For years, he had driven and criticized and condemned his employees without strict or without stint. stint? stint. Oh, oh. stint. 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 Apply an ungenerous or inadequate amount of. Ooh, that's good. A stint or discretion. Kindness. Words of application and encouragement were alien to his lips. After studying the principles discussed in this book, this employer sharply altered his philosophy of life. His organization is now inspired with a new loyalty, a new enthusiasm, a new spirit of teamwork. 314 employees, or enemies have been turned into 314 friends. As he proudly said in his speech before the class, when I used to walk through my establishment, no one greeted me. My employees actually looked the other way when they saw me approaching, but now they all now they are all my friends, and even the janitor calls me by my first name. This employer gained more profit, more leisure, and what is infinitely more important, he found far more happiness in his business and in his home. Countless numbers of salespeople have sharply increased their sales by the use of these principles. Many have opened up new accounts, accounts that have had formerly solicited in vain. Uh, executives have given increased authority, increased pay. One executive reported a large increase in salary because his applied because he applied these truths. Another and another an executive in the Philadelphia Gas Works Company has slated for dem demotion. Oh shit! When he was 65 because of his belligerence, because of his inability to lead people skillfully, this training not only saved him from the de 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 demotion but brought him a promotion with with increased pay. On innumerable occasions, spouses attending the banquet given at the end of a course had told me that their homes have been much happier since their husbands or wives started this training. People are frequently astonished at the new re results they achieve. It all seems like magic. In some cases, in their enthusiasm, they have telephoned me at home on Sundays because they couldn't wait 48 hours to report their achievements at the regular session of work. One man has was so steered by a talk on these principles that he sat far into the night discussing them with one with other members of the class. At three o'clock in the morning, the others went home, but he was so shaken by the realization of his own mistakes, so inspired by the vista of a new and richer world opening before him that he was unable to sleep. He didn't sleep that night and the next day or the next night. Oh my God, who was he? A naive, untrained individual ready to gush over any, over any new theory that came along. No, far from it. He was a sophisticated, Blaze dealer in art, very much the man about town. Oh, very much the man about town who spoke three languages fluently and was graduated of was graduate of two European universities. While writing this chapter, I received a letter from a German of the old school, an aristocrat who forbears had served 
for generations as professional army officers under the Hazan Zaral's his letter written for from a trans transatlantic streamer. Well, telling about the application of these principles rose almost the, to a religious fever. Another man, man, an old New Yorker, a Harvard graduate, a wealthy man, the owner of a large carpet factory, declared he had learned more in 14 weeks through this system of training about the fine art of influence people than he had learned about the same subject during his four years in college. Absurd? Laughable? Fantastic? Of course, you are privileged to dismiss the statement with whatever adjective you wish. I am merely re reporting without comment a declaration made by a cons conservative in in eminently what does that word mean in eminently a notable degree oh title a notable degree in in eminently successful harvard graduate in a public address to approximately 600 people at the yale club in new york on the evening of thursday february 23 1933 compared to what we ought to be said the famous professor william james of harvard Compared to what we ought to be, we are only half awake. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Starting, starting the things broadly, the human individual thus lives far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts which he habitually fails to use. Those powers which you habitually fail to, fail to use, the sole purpose of this book is to help you discover, develop, and profit by those dormant and unused assets. Education, said Dr. John G. Hibben, former president of Princeton University, is the ability to meet life situations. If by the time you have finished reading this book, three chapters of this book, if you are then a little better equipped to meet life situations, then I shall consider this book to be a, a total failure so far as you are concerned. Four, the great aim of education, said Herbert Spencer, is not knowledge but action. Wow. And this is an action book. Dale Carnegie, 1936. Nine suggestions on how to get the most out of this book. Um, I feel like that's not where I want it to be. Hold on. I know toast. Okay, I guess it is. Okay, back we go. This is my my um, shoulders are kind of hurting. I don't know why. Nice suggestions on how to get the most out of this book. If you wish to get the most out of this book, there is one indispensable requirement as essential, infinitely more important than any rule or technique. Unless you have this one fundamental re re request, re requisite, a thousand rules on how to study will avail little. And if you do this carnal endowment, then you can achieve wonders without reading any suggestions for getting the most out of a book. What is the magic requirement? Just this. A deep, driving desire to learn. A vigorous determination to increase your ability to deal with people. How you can develop such an urge? By continually reminding yourself of how important these principles are to you. Picture to, to yourself how these, how their mastery will aid you in leading a richer, f fuller, happier, and more fulfilling life. Say to yourself over and over, my popularity, my happiness, and sense of worth depend to no sh small extent upon my skill in dealing with people. Read each chapter rapidly, at first to get a bird's eye view of it. You will probably be tempted then to rush on to the next one, but don't, unless you are reading merely for entertainment. But if you are reading because you want to increase your skill in human relations, then go back and reread each chapter thoroughly. In the long run, this will mean saving time and getting results. Stop frequently in your reading to think over what you are reading. Ask yourself just how and when you can apply each suggestion. Read with a crayon, pencil, pen, magic marker, or highlighter in your hand. When you come across a suggestion that you feel you can use, draw a line beside it. If it is a four-star suggestion, then underscore every sentence or high highlight it, or mark it with four stars. Marking or un underscoring a book makes it more interesting and far easier to review rapidly. I knew a woman who had been, off been an office manager for a large insurance concern for 50, 15 years. Every month, she read all of the insurance contracts her company had issued that month. Yes, she read many of them, many of the same contracts over month after month, year after year. Why? Because experience had taught her that the only way she could keep their provisions clear, because 
Experience had taught her that that was the only way she could have kept their provisions clearly in mind. I once spent almost two years writing a book on public speaking and yet I found it hard to keep going back over it from time to time in order to remember that remember what I had written in my own book. <laughs> the, rap, rap, the, the rapid the rapidity with which we forgot is astonishing. So if you want to get a real lasting benefit from this book, don't imagine that skimming through it once will suffice. After reading it thoroughly, you ought to spend a few hours reviewing it every month. Keep it on your desk in front of you every day. Glance through it often. Keep constantly imp imp impressing yourself with the rich possibilities of improvement that still lie in the offering. Remember that the only use of this principle can be made habitually only by a constant and vigorous campaign of review and application. There is no other way. Bernard Shaw once remarked, If you teach a man everything, he will, learn, he will never learn. Shaw was right. Learning in an active process, we learn by doing. So if you desire to master the principles that you are studying in this book, do something about them. Apply these rules to every opportunity. If you don't, you will forget them quickly. Only knowledge that is used sticks in your mind. You will probably find it difficult to apply these suggestions all the time. I know because I wrote the book. And yet frequently I found it difficult to apply everything I, I advocated for. For example, when you are displeased, it is much easier to criticize and condemn than it is to try to understand. And the other person's point of view, it is frequently easier to find results than to find praise. It is more natural to talk about what you want than to talk about the other person's wants, and so on. So as you read this book, remember that, there are, that you are not merely trying to acquire information. You are attempting to form new habits. Ah, yes, you are attempting to attempting a new way of life ah yes mm, yes that will require time and persistence and daily application so refer to these pages often regard this as a working handbook on human relations and whenever you are com confronted with some principle specific problem such as handling a child winning your spouse to your way of thinking or satisfying an ir irritated customer hes hesitant about doing the natural th thing the impulsive thing this is usually wrong. Instead, turn to these pages and review the paragraphs you have under underscored. Then try these new ways and watch them achieve magic for you. Offer your spouse, your child, or some business associate a dime or a dollar every time he or she catches you violating a certain principle. Make a lively game out of mastering these, these rules. Uh, the president of an important Wall Street bank once described in talk before one of my classes a highly efficient system he used for self-improvement. This man had little formal schooling, yet he had become one of the most important financiers in America, and he confessed that he owed most of his success to constant application of his home, homemade system. This is what he does. I'll put it in his own words, or as accurately as I can remember. For years, I have kept an engagement book showing all the appointments I had during the day. My family never made any plans for me on Saturday night, for the family knew that I had devoted a part of each Saturday evening to the illuminating process of self-examination and review and appraisal appraisal after dinner i went off by myself opened an engagement book and thought over all of the interviews discussions and meetings that had been had taken place over the week i asked myself what mistakes did i make that time what did i do that was right and what way could i have improved my performance what lessons can i learn from the experience i often found that this weekly review made me very unhappy. I was frequently astonished at my own blunders. Of course, as the years passed, these blunders became less frequent. Sometimes I was inclined to pat myself on the back a little after one of these sessions. This system of self-analysis, self-education, continued year after year, did more for me than any other one thing had, had I have ever attempted. It helped me improve my ability to make decisions and it aided me en enormously in all my contacts with people. I cannot recommend it too highly. Why not use a similar system to check up on your application of the principles discussed in this book? If you do, two things will result. First, you will find yourself engaged in an educational process that is both intriguing and priceless. Second, you will find that your ability to meet and deal with people will grow enormously. Yeah, I actually started doing that. Like where, um, like every day, I just kind of sit down and I think about all my interactions with everybody and all the things that I did. And I kind of do a quick review where it's like, okay, did I make anybody feel weird? Did I say anything bad? Uh, what were the things that I did right? 
Uh, are there any like like on uh, loose ends anything that's not tied up properly um do i need to does this person understand what i meant by this do, do, is it worth it to go back and and put that effort in to help them understand that um uh this is a good idea uh do i do i tell this person now later or you know just stuff like that and and that self-review really helps me like kind of put everything into perspective and feel like my day is that the day was good the, the day was productive and i got stuff done and it's really rewarding and it feels really good even even when i acknowledge like the bad stuff that i did because so consciously i always know like if you do something that's not right it was just, it was just it's there you know you did something that's not right but it's just not confronted and confronting it really adds perspective and insight and kind of like puts things into perspective so it doesn't really bother you as much or subconsciously as much at least for me that's what it does it's really i think it's really helpful i think that's one of the things i picked up from this book You will find at the end of this book blank pages on which you should record your triumphs in the application of these principles. Be specific, give names, dates, results. Keeping such a record will inspire you to greater efforts. And how fascinating these entries will be when you chance upon them if some evening years from now. In order to get the most out of this book, develop a deep driving desire to master the principles of human relations. Read each chapter twice before going on to the next one. As you read, stop frequently to ask yourself how you can apply each su su suggestion. Underscore each important idea. Review this book each month. Apply these principles at every opportunity. Use a volume as a working handbook to help you solve your daily problems. Make a lively game out of learning your off of your learning by offering some friend a dime or a dollar every time he or she catches you violating one of these principles. Check up each week on the progress you are making. Ask yourself what mistakes you have made, what improvement, what lessons you have learned for the future. Keep notes in the back of your of, the, of this book showing how and when you have applied these principles. Part 1. Fundamental Techniques in Handling People If you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive. On May 7, 1931, the most sensational manhunt New York City has ever known had come to its climax. After weeks of search, two gun Crowley, the killer, the gunman who didn't smoke or drink, was at, at bay, trapped in his sweetheart's apartment on the West End Avenue. 150 policemen and detectives laid siege to his top floor, hidden away. They chopped holes in the roof. They tried to smoke out Crowley's, the uh, cop killer, with tear gas. They then mounted their machine guns on surrounding buildings, and for more than an hour, one of New York's Fine residential areas re river reverberated with the crack of pistol fire and the rat -tat, tat tat of machine guns. Crowley, crouching behind an overstuffed chair, fired increase increasingly at the police. Ten thousand excited people watched the battle. Nothing like it had ever been seen before on the sidewalks of New York. When Crowley was captured, police commissioners E. P. Mulroney declared that the two gun Dispatch dispatcher row was one of the most dangerous criminals ever encountered in the history of New York. He will kill, said the commissioner at the drop of a feather. But how did Two Gun really regard himself? We know because while the police were firing into his apartment, he wrote a letter addressed to whom it may concern. And as he wrote, the blood flowing from his wounds left a crimson trail on the paper. In his letter, Crowley said, Under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one. One that would do no harm, nobody any harm. Aww. <laughs> a short time before this, Crowley had been having a, a necking party with his girlfriend <laughs> on a on a country road out on Long Island. Suddenly, a policeman walked up to his car and said, "Let me see your license." Without saying a word, Crowley drew his gun and cut the policeman down with a shower of lead. As the denying officer fell. Dying officer fell. Crowley leaped out of the car, grabbed the officer's revolver, and fired another bullet into the prost prostitute's body. The prostrates? I think I read it wrong. But anyways. And that was the killer who said, Under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one. One that would do nobody any harm. Crowley was sentenced to the electric chair when he arrived to his death house in Sing Sing. Did he say, This is what I get for killing people? No. He said, This is what I get for defending myself. The point of the story is this. Two gun, Crowley didn't blame himself for anything. Is that an unusual attitude among criminals? If you think so, listen to this. I have spent the best years of my life giving people 
uh, the lighter pleasures, hopping them with a good time, and all I get is abuse. The existence of a hunted man. That's Al Capone speaking. Yes, America's most notorious public enemy, the most sinister gang leader who has ever shot up Chicago. Capone didn't condemn himself. He actually regarded himself as a public benefactor, an unappreciated and misunderstood public benefactor. And so did Dutch Schultz. Before he crumbled up under ga gangster bullets in New Newark, Dutch Schultz, one of New York's most notorious rats, said in a <laughs> wanna maker, learned this lesson early. But I personally had it to blunder through this old world for a third of a century before it even began to dawn upon me that 99 times out of 100 people don't criticize themselves for anything, no matter how wrong it may be. Criticism is futile because it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes him strive to justify himself. Criticism is dangerous because it wounds a person's precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. B.F. Skinner, the world famous psychologist, proved through his experiments that an, an animal re rewarded for good behavior will learn much more rapidly and retain what it learns for far more effectively than an animal punished for bad behavior. Later studies have shown that the same applies to humans. By criticizing, we do not make lasting changes and often incur resentment. And style, a Han Seeley, another great psychologist said, as much as we thirst for approval, we dread condemnation. The resentment that criticism in, in 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 genders in, in genders and demoralize employees family members and friend, friends and still not correct the situation that has been condemned george b johnson of ended oklahoma is the safety con coordinator for an got that granola bar in my mouth for an engineer company one of his responsibilities is to see that his employees were their hard hats whenever they are on the job in the field. He reported that whenever he came across workers who were not wearing hard hats, he would tell them with a lot of authority and the, the reg regulation that they must comply. As a result, he would get stolen acceptance. And often after he left, the workers would remove their hats. He decided to try a different approach. The next time he found some of the workers not wearing their hats, the hard hats, he asked if the hats were uncomfortable or did not fit properly. Then he reminded the men in a pleasant tone of voice that the hats were designated to protect them from injury and suggested that if it always be worn on the job the results was increased compliance with the reg regulations and no resentment or emotional upset you will find examples of the fertility of criticism bristle bristling on the thousand pages of history take for example the famous quarrel between theodore roosevelt and president Taft, a quarrel that split the republican party put woodrow wilson in the white house and wrote bold, luminous lines across the First World War and alter the flow of history. Let's review the facts quickly. When Theodore Roosevelt stepped out of the White House in 1908, he supported Taft, who was elected president. Then Theodore Roosevelt went and went off to Africa to shoot lions. <laughs> when he returned, what? Well, he exploded. He denounced Taft for his con con conservation, conservatism. Fido secured the nomination for the third term himself, formed the Bull Moose Party, and all but demolished the GOP in the election that followed. William Howard Taft and the Republican Party carried only two states, Vermont and Utah, the most disastrous defeat the party has ever known. Theodore Roosevelt blamed Taft, but did President Taft blame himself? Of course not. With tears in his eyes, Taft said, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. Who was to blame? Roosevelt or Taft? Frankly, I don't know, and I don't care. The point of trying to make it is that all of Theodore Roosevelt's criticism didn't persuade Taft that he was wrong. It merely made Taft strive to justify himself and to retaliate. What does this mean? Reiterate? Say something, yeah, I should reiterate. To say, to reiterate with tears in his eyes. I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. Or take the teapot dome oil scandal. It kept the only the newspapers ringing with indignation in the early 1920s. It rocked the nation. Within the memory of the living men, nothing like it had ever happened before. American public life. Before in American public life, here are the bare facts of the scandal. Albert B. Fall, 
Secretary of the Interior in Handling Cabinet was entrusted with the leasing of government oil reserves at Elk Hill and Teapot Dome, oil reserves that have been set aside for the future use of the Navy. Did Secretary Fall permit captive bidding? No, sir. He ha handed the, the fat, juicy contract outright to his friend Edward Al Don Donahue. And what did Donahue do? He grove Secretary Fall. What he gave Secretary Fall, what he had pleased to call a loan of one hundred thousand dollars. Let me reread this. Hold on. I feel like I'm butchering this. I'm not doing good. Hold on. So here are the bare facts of the scandal. Albert B. Fall, Secretary of the Interior in Hardening's Cabinet, was entrusted with the leasing of government oil reserves at Elk Hill and Teapot Dome, oil reserves that had been set aside for the future use of the Navy. Did Secretary Fall permit cap competitive bidding? No, sir. He handed the fat, juicy contract outright to his friend Edward L. Donahue. And what did Donahue do? He gave Secretary Fall what he was pleased to call a loan of $100,000. Then. In a, in a high-handed manner, Secretary Fall ordered the United States Marines into the district to drive off competitors whose adjacent wells were sapping oil out of the Elk, out of the Elk Hills reserves. These competitors, driven out, off the ground at the end, ends of guns and bayonets, rushed into court and blew the lid off the teapot dome scandal. A stench arose, arose so vile that it ruined the Harding administration, nauseated an entire nation, threatened to wreck the Republican Party, and put Albert B. Fall behind prison bars. Fall was condemned viciously, condemned as a few men in public life have ever been. Did he repent? Never. Years later, Herbert Hoover in, 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 intimidated in, in intimid, intimid, imitated? I think it's imitated. Pretty sure it's like imitated. In a public speech that public Harding's death had been due to mental anxiety and worry because a friend had betrayed him. When Miss Fall heard that, she sprang from her chair, she wept, she shook her fist and I faint and screamed, What? Harding betrayed by Fall? No, my husband never betrayed anyone. This whole house full of gold who would not tempt my husband to do so wrong. He is the one who has been betrayed and led to the slaughter and crucified. Aw, there you are, human nature in action. Wrongdoers blaming everybody but themselves. We are all like that. So when you are you and I are tempted to criticize someone tomorrow, let's remember Al Capone, Two Gun, Crowley, and Albert Fall. Let's realize the criticisms are like homing pigeons. They always return home. Let's re realize that, that the person we are going to correct and condemn will probably justify himself himself or herself and condemn us in return. Or like the gentle taff will say, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. On the morning of April 15th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln lay dying in the hall bedroom of a cheap lodging house directly across the street from Ford's the theater where Johnson Wickles Booth had shot him. Lincoln's long body lay stretched diagonally across a sagging bed that went too short for him. That was too short for him. A cheap reproduction of Rosa's Bonhurst famous painting, The Horse Fair, hung above his head, hung above that bed. And dismissal gas jet flick flickered yellow light. What, what is this painting flung in the bed and a dismissal gas jet flicked flickered yellow light as Lincoln lay dying secretary of war S S Stanton said there lies the most perfect ruler of men that the world has ever seen what was the secret of Lincoln's success in dealing with people I studied the life of Lincoln Abraham Lincoln for 10 years and devoted all three years to writing and reviewing a book entitled Lincoln the unknown I believe I have made a detailed and exhaustive as exhaustive a study of Lincoln's personal and home life as it was possible for any being to make. I made a special study of Lincoln's method of dealing with people. Did he indulge in criticism? Oh, yes. As a young man in the Pigeon Creek Valley of Indiana, he not only criticized, but he wrote letters and poems ridiculing people and dropped these letters on the country roads where they were sure to be found. One of these letters arose res resentments that buried, that burned for a lifetime. Even after Lincoln had become a practicing lawyer in Springfield, Illinois, he attacked his opponents openly in letters published in the newspapers, but he did this just once too often. In the autumn of 1842, he ridiculed a vain, pugnacious political politician by the name of James Shields. Lincoln lampooned him through an anonymous letter published in the Springfield Journal. The town ward 
roared with laughter. Jill, sensitive to sensitive and proud, bold with indignation. He found out who wrote this letter. He found out who wrote the letter. Leaped on his horse, started after Lincoln, and challenged him to a fight. A duel! <laughs> Lincoln didn't want to fight. He was opposed to dueling, but he couldn't get out of it and saved his honor. He was given the choice of weapons. Since he had very long arms, he chose cavalry broadswords and took lessons in sword fighting from a West Point gra graduate. And on the appointed day, he and Shields met on a sandbar in the Mississippi River, prepared to fight to the death. But at the last minute, their seconds interrupt at the at, at their last seconds interrupted and stopped the duel. That wait, huh? At the last minute, their seconds interrupted and stopped the duel. That was the most lurid, personal, and what's the lurid mean? Vivid in color, especially so as to create an unpleasantly harsh or unnatural effect. Ah, oh, that was the most. Oh, okay, makes sense. Lurid, personal incident in Lincoln's life. It taught him an invaluable lesson in the arts of dealing with people. Never again did he write an insulting letter. Never again did he ridicule anyone. And from that time on, he almost never criticized anybody for anything. Time after time during... <laughs> time after time uh, during the Civil War, Lincoln put a new grand general at the head of the army of the Pro Protamac. And each one in turn, McKellen, Pope, Burnside, Hooker, Med Medin, blundered tragically and drove Lincoln to pacing the floor in despair. Half the nation savagely condemned the incompetent generals, but Lincoln, with malice towards none, with charity for all, held his peace. One of his favorite quotes, uh, qu quotations was, Judge not that ye be not judge. Hmm. Judge not that ye be not judge. Wait, what does that mean? Judge not that ye be not judged. Judge not. Uh, not to judge that the person who is not judged. Wait, judge not that ye be not. That me. Oh, okay. I guess you don't judge people because you don't want to be judged. Who was I? Huh? Wait, there we go. And when Miss Lincoln and others spoke harshly, of the southern people lincoln replied don't criticize them they are just what we would be under similar circumstances true yet if any man ever had occasionally uh, had occasion to criticize surely it was lincoln let's just take one illustration the battle of gettysburg was fought during the the first three days of july 1863 during the night of july 4th lee began to retreat southward while storm clouds del 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 delude the country with rain when Lee reached the Potomac with his defended ar defeated army, he found a swollen, impassable river in front of him, and a vic victorious Union army behind him. Lee was in a trap. He couldn't escape. Lincoln saw that here was a golden, heaven-sent opportunity, the opportunity to capture Lee's army and end the war. Immediately, so was with a surge of high hope, Lincoln ordered Meta not to call a, c a council of war, but to attack Lee immediately. Lincoln telegraphed his orders and then sent a specific a special message to Madrid demanding immediate action. And what did General Mida do? He did the opposite, the very opposite of what he was told to do. He called a council of war in direct violation of Lincoln's orders. He hesitated. He pro procrastinated. He telegraphed all manner of excuses. He refused point blank to attack Lee. Finally, the war was reduced and Lee escaped over the Probanac with his forces. Lincoln was furious. What does this mean? Lincoln cried to his son Robert. Great God, what does this mean? We had them within our grasp, and we only had to stretch forth with our hands, and they were ours. <laughs> Yet nothing that I could say or do could make the army move. Under the circumstances, almost any general could have defeated Lee. If I had gone up there, I ha I could have whipped my him myself. In bitter dis disappointment, Lincoln sat, sat down and wrote Medill this letter. And remember, at this period of his life, Lincoln was extremely conservative and restrained in his phraseology. So this letter coming from Lincoln in 1863 was trans was tantamount to the ser servant's rebuke. My dear general, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of this misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within our, our easy grasp. All we had uh, and to have closed upon him would have would it would uh, fuck I'm going to read this. Uh, I'm getting too excited. Hmm. 
I've cleared my head. Yeah. My dear general, I do not believe you anticipate you appreciate the magnitude of this misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within our easy grasp, and to have closed upon him would, in connection with our other late successes, at would have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. If you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, how can you possibly do so south of the river? When you can take with you very few, no more than two thirds of the force you had, you then had in hand, it would be unreasonable to expect and I do not expect that you can now affect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed Im immeasurably because of it. What do you do, Madi? What What do you suppose Madi did? Toast. Come on. What did you suppose Madi did when he read the letter? Madi never saw that letter. Lincoln never mailed it. <laughs> oh shit! It was found among his papers after his death. I guess is. And this is only a guess that after writing this letter, that letter, Lincoln looked out of the window and said to himself, just a minute, maybe I ought not be too hasty, be so hasty. It is easy enough for me to sit here in, in the quiet of the White House and order Madrid to attack, but if I had been up at Gettysburg and, it, and if I had seen so much blood as Virginia has seen during the last week, and if my ears had been pierced with the screams and shrieks of the wounded and dying, maybe I wouldn't have wouldn't be so anxious to attack either. If I had Madrid's timid temperament, perhaps I would have done just what he had done. Anyhow, it is water under the bridge now. If I send this letter, it will relieve my feelings, but it will make Madrid try to justify himself. It will make him condemn me. It will arouse hard feelings, impair all his further usefulness as a commander, and perhaps force him to resign fr from the army. So, as I have already said, Lincoln put the letter aside for the for he had learned by better experience that sharp criticisms and rebukes almost inevitably and in futile and fru futility theodore roosevelt said that when he as president was confronted with we well, actually talk about that's that's actually really sick i think we all have moments like that in our own life where it's like like, like you this person uh immeasurably fucked you over due to their own incompetence or their own like just unwillingness to cooperate right or whatever it may be and you will actually have carte blanche like you have justifications and and reasonings and backing and understanding from the people around you that you like just go off on them right but what will that achieve in the end right or not even achieve or because because that's kind of begging the question right like what like what positive outcome would it get like this what outcome will come of that right well just the person will feel like shit the person will probably resent you for 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 um uh, kind of singling them out in the way that you that you have uh um you depending on the person most often than not it will dig them deeper into whatever decision that they made and because of that you're like kind of like, subverting their ability to um self-reflect and and you make it so it's like well well to confront this really painful thing that that they caused they need to accept not only that they messed up but your attack on them, right? And and, and, and the, the the baggage that can that comes with that, because it's really hard for anybody to really separate those two things, especially when when you're Abraham Lincoln, right, or whoever you are to that person. And it really doesn't like you said. Just look at what you will achieve, right? And it kind of comes down to acting on your wants, not your actions. Uh, you acting on your wants, not your emotions. Yeah, that was that was a really good one. I know for a couple of times in my life where, like uh, this person, my friend Jim, we went on a road trip recently. Uh, in high school, uh, I remember uh, he like he would like just do like this this neurotic annoying shit, right? And one day I just called him out in front of everybody, like, man, it's this fucking shit. You do this all the time, this and this and this and this. And then he was just like, Ugh! he kind of like froze up, like, wait, what's going on? Like, uh, and then he tried, like, he started justifying himself, and then we started like arguing, and then it kind of divulged from there. And everybody was like entertained by it, and, like kind of hyping up by it, but it wasn't. It wasn't good. It didn't accomplish anything. If anything, it just made him just more um, like on on edge and on guard, you know. And why would you want that, especially with somebody that you interact with every day? Not even not, not even for them just to feel that way, but for them to just anticipate that for you, and that, that that just makes everything harder for everybody, right? 
feel like what I'm saying is vacuous. Like it doesn't mean anything. I just keep reading because this guy, this what this guy says means something. So, um, yeah. So Theodore Roosevelt said that he was that when he, as president, was confronted with a perplexing problem, he used to lean back and look up at a large painting of Lincoln, which hung above his desk in the White House, and ask himself, "What would Lincoln do if he were in my shoes? How would he have solved this problem?" The next time we are tempted to adamish somebody. Let's pull a $5 bill out of our pocket. Look at Lincoln's picture of the bill and ask, how would Lincoln handle this problem if I, if he had, if he had it? Do I have $5 somewhere? No, I think I just have fucking dollar bills right now. Yeah, I just got, I think this, this is Ben Franklin, right? No, that's George Washington. This guy, George, when I say that, that's wrong with me. <laughs> I'm broke as fuck, guys. All right, uh, <laughs> Mark Twain lost his temper occasionally and wrote letters that turned his paper brown. For example, he once wrote to a man who had aroused his ire, The thing for you is a brutal permanent. You have only to speak and I will see that you get it. Right, let me write something. Mark Twain lost his temper occasionally and wrote letters that turned the paper brown. For example, he once wrote to a man who aroused his ire, The thing for you is a burial permit. You have only to speak, and I will see that you get it. Jesus Christ, what the fuck, man? On another occasion, he wrote to an editor about a proofreader's attempts to improve my spelling and punctuation. He ordered, set the matter ac according to my copy hereafter, and see that the proofreader retains his suggestions in the mush of his decayed brain. What? Set Set the matter according to my copy hereafter, and see that the proofreader retains his suggestions in the mush of his decayed brain. Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> the writer, <laughs> dude, this is like fucking shit posting before the internet. The, the, the writing of these stinging letters made Mark Twain feel better. They allowed him to blow off steam, and the letters didn't do any real harm, because Mark Twain's wife secretly lifted them out of the mail. They were never sent. Do you know someone you would like to change and regulate and improve? Good, that is fine. I am all in favor of it, but why not begin on your own self? From a purely selfish standpoint, that is not a lot more profitable than trying to improve others. Yes, and a lot of a lot less dangerous. Don't complain about the snow on your neighbor's roof, said Confucius, when your own doorstep is unclean. Fucking true! Ooh, I think. I think one of the one of the best things that I that I developed and, and realized on the road trip with my friend was that we would talk and have discussions and debates, right? Because we're very argumentative, we're, we're very rooted. We have a, a lots of, lots of big heavy beliefs, right? Like we're we're we're, we're somewhat well informed, right? In, in in whatever in ways, and we could discuss and have a conversation and talk about things, right? But the second he um, dismisses me, the second he doesn't care what I have to say, the second he uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, like removes authority or moves like he 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 like dismisses me or whatever whatever like weird thing right? That that's just like an attack on me. Uh, I just don't engage with that anymore. I just I'm like, hey, you're over there, and you're getting further over there, and I'm not gonna go over there, and I'm gonna stay right here. And if you want to hear me out, that's awesome. And and it will take the time for that, right? Because because. Because if you're gonna like create, if you're gonna jump to conclusions and then argue the and argue things that I that I'm not even saying, then you're not listening to me, and that's disrespectful to me, and I'm, and I'm not gonna um, allow that to happen to myself. So I just want to engage with that, right? And and so that's kind of like a more of a of a nuanced way of going about it because it's I'm kind of just it's all about me, right? I'm keeping a check on myself, and, and I'm not gonna go there with him. Right? And like it's okay to disagree. It's okay to have this out, and I want to know why you disagree, and I want to know where you're coming from. But I'm not gonna sit here and have you um, just like talk over me to um, create all these points that I don't really have, and kind of just just talk at me, right? And 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 and, and throughout the, the trip that we had, because we were in a confined space for four days, there was a big change with him, and now like all the conversations that we have are just. Like two ways, it's always there's always good back and forth, and we always understand each other at the end of the conversation. 
and and he always like takes a little bit of what I say and then incorporates to himself and I take a little bit of what he says and incorporate it to myself and it's really it's like fucking awesome now, right? It's sick. So and it takes it takes somebody has to make the first step, right? Somebody has to the first step of just sacrificing and swallowing some amount of your pride for just a better beneficial relationship with that person. Or at least on an individual level, right? On the visual scale. And so I guess like um the teachings of like kind of make sure that that you're clean before you criticize someone else's cleanliness or whatever. It's really important. Or like leading by example and stuff. When I was still young and trying hard to impress people, I wrote a foolish letter to Richard Harding Davis, an author who once loomed large on the literary horizon of America. I was preparing a magazine article about Arthur's and I asked Davis to tell me about his method of work. A few weeks earlier, I had received a letter from someone with the, this notion at the bottom, dictated but not read. I was quite impressed. I felt that the writer must be very big and busy and important. I wasn't the slightest bit busy, but I was eager to make an impression on Richard Harding Davis. So I ended my short note with the words, dictated but not read. He never troubled to answer this, the letter. He simply returned it to me with the scribbled across the bottom. Your bad manners are exceeded only by your bad manners. True, I had blundered, and perhaps I discovered this rebuke, but being human, I resented it. I represent, I resented it so sharply that when I read of the death of Richard Harding Davis 10 years later, the, the one thought that still persisted in my mind, I am ashamed to admit, was the hurt he had given me. If you and I want to stir up resentment t tomorrow, if you and I want to stir up resentment tomorrow that may wrinkle across the decades and endure until death, just let us indulge in a little stinging criticism, no matter how certain we are that it is justified. When dealing with people, let us remember we are not dealing with creatures of logic. <laughs> we are dealing with creatures of emotion, creatures of bristling, creatures bristling with prejudice. Can I read that word? Prejudice. Prejudice? Prejudice. I, I can pronounce it, but when I read it, it just fucks me up. Prejudice and motivate by pride and vanity. Bitter criticism caused the sensitive Thomas. Thomas Hardy, one of the finest novelists ever to enrich English literature to give up forever in writing of fiction. Criticism drove Thomas Chatterton, the English poet, to suicide. Benjamin Franklin, tactless in his youth, became so diplomatic, so ardent at handling people that he was made America's ambassador to France. This, the secret of his success? I will speak ill of no man. Oh, it's so hard, but I, yes. He said, and spark, and speak all the good I know of everybody. Mm. Facts. That's so hard to do. <laughs> He's like, oh God. But no, you just want to vent. So no, you just want to just let it out. Any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain. And most fools do. But it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. A great man shows his greatness. Say Carly. By the way, he treats little... But all men shows his greatness. Say Carly Lee. By the way, he treats little men. Bob Hoover, a famous test pilot. Oh man, I, I want to speak on that real quick too. It's like... Personally, it's so difficult to, uh, like, like uh, if you have a bad interaction or a bad impression of somebody, or you hear bad words about somebody, to just filter it out and, 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 and go about them unbiasedly, right? And, because uh, at the end, of the end of the day, man, nobody wants to leave a bad impression on somebody. Nobody, right? Why, why would you? And... And you know that that saying, if you don't like me at my worst, you're not gonna like me at my best, right? And when you get a bad impression of somebody, you catch them at when they're at, at their weak moment, right? You catch them when they're at their worst, when when they're when they're venting, when they're suffering, when when they have these emotions, is this these things that need to come out, right? And they come out and manifest in in these negative, weird ways that rub you the wrong way. And it's so hard to just just like um, uh, it's so hard for any for people to just uh understand understand that fact in of itself and how how people just 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 uh just kind of kind of kind of can be sometimes right and i think it's our responsibility if you want to be a good person if you want to be un be fair and be unbiased and kind of live up to the standards and ideals that benjamin franklin and abraham lincoln to kind of get people like 
the the, the credence and, and the courtesy of of like a second chance in a way of like give them a, a, a fresher impersonation impression of you right a, a better impression um but like for me like i try to forget bad impressions i try to forget like just weird bad vibes and because it doesn't really benefit me in the long run right and, and when i'm talking to somebody or especially somebody that's like that has fucked up in the past like like for them to move on you everyone else needs to move on as well right <laughs> so yeah Bob Hoover, a famous test pilot and frequent performer at air shows, was returning to his home in Los Angeles from an air show in San Diego. I described in the magazine flight operations at 300 feet in the air, both engineers suddenly stopped by deaf maneuvering. By deaf maneuvering, he managed to land the, the plane. Okay, but it badly damaged, although nobody was hurt. Hoover's first act after the emergency landing was to inspect the airplane's fuel, just as he suspected the World War II pro pro propeller plane had, he had been flying had been fueled with jet fuel rather than gasoline. Upon returning to the airport, he asked to see the mechanic who had serviced his plane. The young man was sick with the, the, ang the agony of his mistake. Tears streamed down his face as Hoover approached. He had just caused the loss of a very expensive plane and it could have just caused the loss of three lives as well. You can't imagine Hoover's anger. One could anticipate the tongue lashing that this proud and precise pilot would have unleashed for the, that carelessness. But Hoover did not scold the mechanic. He didn't even criticize him. Instead, he put his big arm around the man's shoulder and said, To show you, I'm sure that you'll never do this again. I want you to service my F-51 tomorrow. <laughs> uh, af often, parents are tempted to criticize their ch children. You would expect me to say, don't, but I will not. I am really going to say, before you criticize them, read one of the classics of American journals, Father Forgets. It originally appears as an editorial in the People's Home Journal. We are re reprinting it here with the author's permission as condensed in the Reader's Digest. Father Forgets is one of the, those little precious... Ah, oh, fuck. Father Forgets is one of those little pieces which dashed off in the moments of sincere feeling. Strikes an echoing chord in so many readers as to become a a a, 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 per, a um, lasting or ex existing for a long or apparently infinite time, enduring or continually recurring. For it's like a like a, a preamble, right? Is that what it is? Pre preamble. I think that's what it is. Re reprint favorite. Since its first appearance, Father Forgets has been reproduced, writes the author W. Livingston Land in hundreds of magazines. No, don't do it, toast! And houses or organs. And in newspapers, the country over. Man, just fuck, I can't, let me just reread this. Oof. Father Forgets is one of those little pieces which dashed off in a moment of sincere feeling. Strikes an echoing chord in many readers as to become a pre preamble reprint favorite. Since its first appearance, Father Forgets has been reproduced, writes the author W. Livingston Larn, in hundreds of magazines and houses and organs, and in newspapers the country over, it has been reprinted almost and extensively in many foreign languages. I have been given personal permission to thousands who wish to read it in from schools, church, and lecture pro platforms. It has been on the air in countless occasions and programs. Oddly enough, college protocols have used it in high school magazines. Sometimes a little, oh, fucking cat, dude. Sometimes little pieces Seems mysteriously to click. This one certainly did. Sometimes a little piece seems mysteriously to click. This one certainly did. Man, I fuck. Whatever. Fuck. Fuck this. I'm just gonna read it. Father forgets. W. Livingston learned. Listen, son. I am saying this as you lie asleep. One little paw crumpled under your cheek, and the blonde curls thickly wet on your damp forehead. I have stolen into your room alone just a few minutes ago, as I sat reading my paper in the library. I. A sniffling wave of remorse swept over me. Guilty, I came to your bedside. There are things I was thinking. Son, I have been cross to you. 
I scolded you as you were dressing for school because you gave me your face merely a dab with a towel. I took you to task for not cleaning your shoes. I called you out angrily when you threw some of your things on the floor. At breakfast, I found fault too. You spilt things, you gulped down your food, you put your elbows on the table, you spread butter too thick on your bread, and as you started off to play and I made for my train, you turned and waved a hand on and I waved a hand and called goodbye daddy and I frowned and said in reply, Hold your shoulders back. Then it began all over again. In the late afternoon, I as I came up the road I spied on you. Down on your knees, playing marbles, there was holes in your stockings. I humiliated you before your boyfriends by marching you ahead of me to the house. Stockings were expensive, and if I had to buy them, you would be more careful. And if you had to buy them, you would be more careful. Imagine that, son, from a father. Do you remember later when I was reading in the library how you came in timidly with a sort of hurt look in your eyes when I glanced up over my paper, impatient at the interruption? You, hesitant, you hesitated at the door. What is it you want? I snapped. You said nothing, but ran across in one tumultuous plunge and threw your arms around my neck and kissed me and your small arms tightened with affection that God had sent blooming in your heart and which even neglect could not wither. And then you were gone, padding up the stairs. Well, son, it was shortly after that my paper slipped from my hands and a terrible sickening fear came over me. What was, what has habit been doing to me? The habit of finding fault, of reprimanding, this was my reward to you for being a boy. It was not that I did not love you. It was that I expected too much of your, of youth. I was measuring you by the yardstick of my own years. And there was much that was good and fine and true in your character. The little heart of you was as big as the dawn itself. Over the wide hills, this was shown by your spontaneous impulse to rush in and kiss me goodnight. Nothing else matters tonight. Son, I have come to your bedside in the darkness and I have knelt there ashamed. It is a feeble atonement. I know you would not understand these things if I told them to you during your waking hours, but tomorrow I will be a real daddy. I will chum with you and suffer with you and suffer and, and when you suffer and laugh when you laugh. I will bite my tongue when in, impatient words come. I will come keep saying as if it were a ritual. He is nothing but a boy, a little boy. I am afraid I had visualized you as a man, yet as I see you now, son, crumpled and weary in your coat, I see that you are still a baby. Yesterday you were in my, in your mother's arms, your head on your shoulder. I have asked too much, too much. Instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. There's a lot more prof profitable and intriguing than criticism. And it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness. To know all is to forgive. As Dr. Johnson said, God himself, sir, does not propose to judge man until the end of his days. Why should you and I? Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. All right. That kind of rocky at the end. But yeah, that this that chapter in itself was really powerful. It was really sick. Um Real. Um I think personally uh, I uh, was able to take a lot from that because when I read this I read it like when did I read it like a year or two ago a year and a half ago I read like half the book a year and a half ago then I read like a little bit more as of late but like I'm about like two-thirds of the way done with it so I never finished it but uh, this chapter really stuck in my head uh, it's really good I remember all the examples and all the um, all the people that mentioned and stuff. It's kind of crazy too how this kind of like manifested into my own life and manifested into my own foundations. Slowly, you know. Really set me on the right track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's get to writing. I'm writing a summary of what we learned. Let's see if I can. Uh.
I don't think that's gonna work the way I thought it would. <laughs> um, hmm. I guess I'll just write and talk as I write. So I, I like to have it written down, you know? I'm pretty sleepy. Kinda wanna take a nap after this, but we'll see what happens. Cause then I'm gonna have, um, Mm. Two hours of League and then two hours of the Overlord game. <laughs> Why is my hair like that? God damn it. Uh, uh. Just being cool and nice and appealing hair. Come on. Why are you doing this to me? Uh, hopefully I don't get fucking copyrighted for this garbage. Ah. Okay. I'm gonna try to write, I guess, like a page in this book. In page summary. I mean, not bad. So, what did I learn? What was really striking for me is um, kind of seeing how, uh, uh, seeing uh, common friend of defensive defensive irrational behavior that is a direct response of uh, criticism and condemning, right? Condemning and complaining. Uh, what follows from this? Falls from such behaviors. Um, hmm. What falls from such behaviors? Creates enemies. Enemies resentment resentment and a measurable divide divide uh divide that cuts more than personal ties But uh, divide that in trenches and trenches the uh, entrenches. 
that plant change with that creates creates um warring camps putting um what was one of those things that I said uh the whole pride right putting uh, pride uh, self dignity pride self dignity um Ah, bah, bah, bah. What else? Putting pride, self dignity, and intelligence. On the line. Instead of Of when illustrated such a way, it's easier to. Um, what's the counterintuitive? Right, it's, it's counterintuitive, right? To see the counterintuitive in entity, see the counterintuitivity. Counterintuitivity that comes from what comes from criticizing. Someone in your goal is to win them over to your side. Seeing the common trend of defensive, irrational behavior that is a direct response to uh, of criticizing condemning and complaining what follows from such behaviors creates enemies resentment and a miserable and a measurable divide a divide that cu that cuts more than personal ties but a divide that in that creates warring camps putting pride self dignity intelligence on the line when illustrated such a such a way when illustrated in such a way it's easier to see the counterintuitivity that comes from criticizing someone when your goal is to win them over to your side i think that's a, that's 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 fair right and then what we could learn is like like, like and now we just what just pop into our head is um moments when we were when our goal is to have them win over to our side but but we have the direct opposite effect because we're we're um we're, we're creating this divide by by criticizing and and condemning and that will like you know entrench the other person and, and it's easier to, like i have like a good template to like to easier to recognize a lot of my own faults and my own memories and to kind of rethink that and reflect on that right, let's read it one more time seeing the common trend of defensive irrational behavior that is direct response of criticizing condemning or complaining what follows from such behaviors creates enemies resentment and a measurable divide a divide that cuts more than personal ties but a divide that creates warring camps Putting pride, self dignity, and uh, self importance. I guess I, I would remove intelligence and put self importance. Let's 
myself importance on the line. When illustrated such a way, it's easy to see the counterintuitivity that comes from criticizing someone when your goal is to win them over to your side. Yeah, that's pretty sick. What happened with that? All right. Uh, hopefully, you guys can write your own summary and of, of what it was and create a template for yourself so that you can better identify uh, scenarios in the moment or just in your past and reflect on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. All right. I feel good. Thank you, man. <laughs>